Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode four, and my name is Christopher Bailey, your host. This week, I speak with Martin Broyce. Martin creates video courses for Real Python. We discuss his course on getting started with Django, and how to learn Python through errors, and how errors really are your friends. He talks about his work with coding nomads, teaching Python around the world. He also provides some tips on debugging and writing good questions. This episode was recorded at an earlier date, and because of recent events, Martin wanted to come back to discuss a new stay-at-home mentorship program he's working on, meant not only for learners, but also for those who want to mentor. you hear all about it near the end of the program. We also answer our first audio question submission. So let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. Interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, welcome, Martin. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Excited to be here. Where are you talking to me from? So I'm currently in Ukraine in Odessa. Oh, wow which is where I just moved to uh, only about a week ago. So where were you living before that? Originally, I'm from Austria. I was born there and grew up there. But in the past three years by now, I've been moving around the world quite a bit. Wow, what, what are some of the places you've been? I've spent quite a while in the US on both ends of the coast and also in the middle. And <laughs> I spent some time in Thailand, spent some time in Vietnam, spent quite a bit of time in Indonesia. That was also professionally related because I was teaching courses there. Cool. I taught a course in Barcelona, so I spent some time in Spain, spent half a year in Australia, and a little stopover in New Zealand, a little little time in Germany and, and in Austria as well, back home. So I think mostly those were the places. And uh, always just a couple of months uh, at a time, essentially. Oh, okay. You get to uh, get an idea of like where you want to live. <laughs> you travel that far all over the world, get uh, lots of choices. Yeah, you get maybe you get a bit of an idea of what what feels nice to you and what doesn't. But you know, a lot of time I also just spent uh, on my computer because that's where I do work. That essentially is the same <laughs> anywhere I go. <laughs> it's uh, some of the perks and uh, disadvantages of <laughs> working remotely, right? Yeah, sometimes you get out to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there's you know, like there's. Obviously, you still get a lot of the different places that you're in because things work differently. You're going to go shopping <laughs> and you do have like times off when you can go around and uh, see some new things. This is all related to the job, but we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more as we get into here with Coding Nomads, right? Right, yeah. that's um, A lot of it is related to that. And because I've been teaching these boot camps in different places with Coding Nomads, so that's a reason I'm, I'm traveling professionally and then... Partly it's also because my girlfriend is from the United States, so we have some visa situations to figure out because <laughs> it's always not, if you have different passports, it's not so easy to, to have a place that you can stay in for an extended amount of time. <laughs> yeah, when I was thinking about you saying that you're in Ukraine right now, I tried to do a podcast, I don't know, four or five years ago, and the idea of was that streaming film studies, we watched, I think it was even on Netflix at the time battleship potemkin mm -hmm. and so i was like oh odessa <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we have our current place like just a couple of minutes walk away from the potemkin stairs so <laughs> we went there the first day and checked it out <laughs> yeah and you ruined it for me you said they're not <laughs> there's like uh movie magic happening even back in whatever year that was <laughs> that they fake the length of the stairs yeah it's just uh, like the shots are cut in a way that it just feels like people keep running down the stairs and walking down the stairs forever and they're kind of long but they're not that long like you can't walk down for five minutes <laughs> <laughs> or ten right. i don't know how long the scene actually is <laughs> right that scene is pretty long <laughs> It's also got an interesting, like, it ends with a road at the bottom, and then there's the port station afterwards. So it's not like a classical, how, you, how, how you'd imagine, like a classical tourist location. Right. But it feels just more part of the city, and they just needed a street down there, and there's the port authority. So that's where it went. <laughs> and I kind of like that. It has, a, it has a nice charm to it. Yeah. How did you get into programming and then into Python? I was thinking about it for a while, and I just 
I had a little bit of pretext, <laughs> which is <laughs> which I want to mention. Sure. Because I have the feeling there's a lot of people out there that have these stories of getting this Commodore from when they were five and then they started programming <laughs> and then they've been doing it since ever since then forever, master's degree and all. Yeah. And I really didn't have anything to do with programming into my late mid twenties, I guess. Sure. Okay. So I I studied a bunch of stuff, humanistics uh, topics mostly. But I uh, finished a degree in biology, but there was no programming involved. Okay. So the first time I really got uh, acquainted with it at all was when MOOCs came to be a thing, this massive open online courses in 2012. Yeah. Okay. What what kind of ones were you checking out? Yeah, there's this famous one, which, which kind of counts as one of the first ones. I don't know how, how correct it is, but that's how I think about it, which was a machine learning MOOC by Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvik. Okay. And it was like the first big MOOC, I think. And I took that together with a couple of friends and did a bit of programming there. It wasn't much because I didn't understand much. It was machine learning after all. <laughs> but it was exciting. What made you interested in it? I, I have some kind of idealistic interest in learning, I guess. Okay. I got really interested when coming to university to be excited. I was excited about having all these options of uh, this is where people go when they actually want to learn something right? as opposed to school where you just sit it out. <laughs> but then I kind of got disappointed in university at some point because it seemed that a lot of people are still there just to get a degree and, and move on. When MOOCs came along, they were different in that sense that people didn't really have anything, like they wouldn't get anything from it, but just the new knowledge that you get. Sure. It's like the, the point of it is not to go get a piece of paper. It's more to gain the knowledge and grow your own learning. Exactly. Yeah. You, the most thing you got back then was a PDF <laughs> that said you participated, which doesn't really do anything. Right. Right. <laughs> but so, yeah, I think there was a really nice community that I just felt like everyone was interested in the topics and wanted to learn. And I think that's what drew me there and kind of reinvigorated. So this, this <laughs> desire to learn something for, for learning it, I guess. Cool. Yeah. Well, so that's part one, I guess. So I, I did some programming there. And then moved on to a bunch of other topics, just because there was a lot out there. But I kind of got hooked with programming. So I, I took some more programming MOOCs and then got into it and got involved with Udacity, where, where I took a couple of classes and then pretty soon started um, also mentoring people at the same time while I was learning it. Okay. So there was some kind of peer learning, mentoring going on. I guess teaching the code has kind of been part of my whole journey through programming from the start. And I think that's also maybe something interesting to keep in mind that you don't have to be necessarily a professional. If you talk to people that are on a similar level as you are, both of you can benefit a lot from that. And that's something I find important as well. Kind of something I want to transmit maybe. Yeah, finding other people community-wise to express your ideas or talk about the journey you're going through. Even give them feedback on on what they're doing in their learning process. Like, where where are you at at the moment? critique or give like feedback on a piece of code that you wrote and that the other person wrote you learn a lot through doing that yeah programming is such a weird thing in the sense that a huge amount of time it's spent alone you you know versus this glowing screen <laughs> you know and uh, yeah. <laughs> it can sometimes feel that way that there's no one else there to to even share the experience with especially if you know friends or family are not into that stuff or even your case like maybe people around you that you're going to school are maybe not interested in those same kind of subjects. That's cool. I, I think that the MOOC thing is kind of a neat way to uh, kind of find a community there. Yeah, I think it is. And um, and some people also learn very well just by themselves, but there's this, uh, I don't know, there's, <laughs> I find it kind of important to like open up programming also to people that are maybe not, don't feel like they're predisposed to learning in that specific way. Oh, I guess. So there's people who learn more socially and there's ways to do that also for programming. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> when did you get into Python? Um, that was pretty at the beginning. So I just, I started off with Python. Python's been the language I did the most, I think. There was a really nice MOOC that got me started with Python. I think it was by Rice University. Yeah. Interactive programming with Python, I think, was what it was called. And we did some game programming there right from the start. I didn't know anything about programming. And through the course, I did some little games, and it was pretty fun. Yeah, I just had a long conversation with John Fincher, another author at Real Python, about how gaming is a really kind of fun way to get into learning in some ways because as you create these things, and it's not only exciting to see them move, but you're learning all 
reasons for conditionals, reasons mm -hmm. for classes, reasons for doing all these things, and you see the results, and then you can share what you've created in to somebody who may not be so interested in looking at just lines of code. You can actually share, hey, this is something I created. Totally, yeah. Rather than just a file. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very cool. How'd you get involved with Real Python then? I think I signed up for one of Dan's newsletters when he was sending out little code snippets, Python code snippets at some point. Okay. I was using the resource from my own learning. I think it's a like it's been a great resource for a while with lots of like interesting tutorials. So I was familiar with it and then Dan started to want to expand using video as well, to send out an email regarding that. I had built a Python course by that time and did a couple of videos. So I was familiar with the process of creating videos for programming screencasts. So I applied, sent in my <laughs> example video, and he liked it. So that's how I got involved and started doing video courses. Cool. What are some of the courses you've done already at RealPython? I did an intro to Jupyter Note books. Okay. And I did a really long one about Django, like intro to Django. And then I did one about reasons for using different editors. Okay. That one just came out, I think. Right. Yeah. Very fresh out. <laughs> Why did you pick the Django course? So I have a job where I, where I teach coding to people in a, a couple of different capacities. And uh, one of them is that I was instructing at boot camps, where we go from beginners, people who probably have tried to learn coding a bit online, but haven't really gotten that far into web development, essentially. And my language of choice was Python. And the framework that I was using for web development is Django. So I had some experience teaching Django to people. I think it's a cool framework. So I just wanted to condense the knowledge that I, that I got from teaching it to people and the problems that we ran into a lot and just trying to make somewhat of a short intro experience that would people get people to a point that they can continue by themselves. There's a lot of stuff I like about what you've added to what was the original article, which is you know kind of creating a portfolio in Django. Mm -hmm. You go into using this as a way to teach yourself as you're working through creating this project. There's a lot of benefits to Django. For a beginner, what's nice is it has a lot of the stuff already included. Yeah, I think it can be both a benefit or a distraction. I think it's I think it's helpful because you don't have to think about every piece separately. And if you if you're just getting started with web development in general, it's nice to have something that's kind of you know like molded into one thing, so that it feels like there's this one thing you have to learn more or less. Right. Yeah. Not having to cobble together all these different technologies, where somebody's done a lot of the legwork. Mm -hmm. Just the idea of it having something like users and a way to log in. Creating those things could be super overwhelming to a beginner. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> and even like the ORM, how you interact with the database is abstracted in a Django kind of way. So you don't really have to deal with writing SQL, for example. What is ORM? What does that stand for? Uh, ORM is an object relational mapper. It's essentially the, the piece of code that interacts between your Python code and the database code. So it translates between those two. Okay. Like maybe SQL Alchemy is another ORM that's pretty wi widely used. And I think Flask uses it a lot. And Django has its own. So Django has a, a database component. Uh, well, it has this mapper. So it has the Django ORM, that's what it's called. And um, it just helps you write code that then inter does the interactions with the database for you. You don't need to write actual SQL code to interact with a SQL database. Which is nice. You don't have to learn yet another language. <laughs> yeah, minus one language exactly. <laughs> if you're if you're getting started with the web, you know, there's anyway so much going on. There's like there's the backend language. There's uh, probably some JavaScript. There's HTML, CSS. There's interacting with the database, um, and it's just like blows in proportions and complexity so much that that is really overwhelming. I think so. Anything that you can cut down at the beginning a little bit makes it easier to to get started and stay a bit excited <laughs> instead of dropping off, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the nice things I, I think about Django in general that I noticed about it is that it's pretty rapid to be able to get sort of a hello world web page going. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you worked with Django? Yeah, I've done a little bit. I was building some data visualization tools. Yeah, I think Django is also, it seems to me to be like one of the things that people come to Python for. I, I, most people, I think most people these days come through uh, for data analysis. Um, but then on the web, web development side, it's, it's mostly Django or Flask, right? Yeah. One of the things that you cover 
in your course, you kind of go into this whole concept of how can errors teach you about programming and make you a better programmer? Do you, can you expand on that? Oh, yeah. So that's something I feel quite important to, maybe it's not taught that often or like that directly. At least I didn't learn it at the beginning so much. So I think it's really important to see this error message as not uh, as your enemies, but um, like I say in this course, like they're new friends that you're discovering and that, that are actually helping you out to to do what you want to do, right? I think that in a framework that's as complex as Django, like you're definitely just going to keep running into some error messages here and there. That's just part of development in general, I think. So if you kind of give up or if you get afraid, if you see an error message and you just get stopped in your heels and you don't know how to continue, then you're not going to get very far. Yeah, that's the common the common reaction, right? It's like an error appears. Yeah, because it's called like value error or, you know, <laughs> method not found. I don't know. And then it's like, usually it's, it's red somewhere here or there. <laughs> They're really not designed to be friendly, I think. <laughs> Why even call them errors? You could, <laughs> you could just call them, I don't know, code feedback or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I just, I just find it important that you understand that this is not like a, it's not a criticism of what you're doing. It's just your computer essentially trying to communicate with you in a way of, you know, like if, as if the computer is a body and it's telling you, hey, something's not working as we expected. Here's what I know, and let's try to figure it out together. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, Mr. Robot going, hello, friend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> trying to give you a clue as to <laughs> what you're supposed to be doing next. Right, yeah. Is there sort of a, some tricks to reading the errors? Yeah, so I guess what you can think about is that uh, if you're looking at this uh, stack traces, which is also what the errors are called sometimes, one thing I do is like look at the last line, which is usually the one that's going to help you forward. So look at the last line first, and then just go with paste it, put it into Google, and look up a couple of answers. That's the first steps I think you can do with an error message. So th that term stack trace, where does that come from? It's just another name for error messages. I think it's the complete thing of all of the lines that you get. When there's an error, then you usually don't just get one line, but you get this whole thing <laughs> that fills up your whole terminal. Yeah, It's all layered there. You're saying you need to read that not top down. Exactly, yeah. Like you wouldn't start where, the, where it starts spitting that stuff out to you. It's actually in reverse. It kind of tells you, like it's the feedback that tells you something went wrong here. That's how I imagine it. Um, I might be wrong about it, right? So, but how I imagine it is, it's kind of like the uppermost level where the error happens. That's the, the lowest line. Okay. And then it kind of digs down into deeper into the program. And that's, <laughs> that's the stack trace further up. But that's, that's how I think about it. So, like if an error appears, you'd see at the very bottom, mm -hmm. in the case of Python, it would say type error or yeah. it's kind of invalid thing. And then, as you kind of look upward, you start to see. Yeah, yeah. And uh, often you don't need to go very far up. If you just look at the lowest line and think about what's going on there, Google it and read a couple of answers, you can probably figure out what's going on. Cool. Just what everyone does. If you do programming, you encounter them a lot. You kind of develop a bit of a more feeling of like other places that you can maybe look. Right. And then above that last line, it actually might point to an actual line number in your code, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I was wondering about there is, you know, as we were talking about Django, since it's a web framework, very often the errors you may see would appear on the actual website that you're you're looking at. What do those errors kind of look like? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so you see them also in your console, like also in the terminal, but uh, Django has this server, the, the live server that displays it and formats it nicely, like a web page, essentially. Then they're a bit easier to look at. And they have this, I don't know if this changed in, in the new versions, but you have this big yellow bar at the top that gives you the error message that's your last line so to say in, in, in django that's where the main error message lies and then okay. it's got a couple of sections down that you can expand they get pretty detailed sometimes because it's such a big complex framework i guess it also points you to the files sometimes so it tells you like in, in this file probably at that point something's probably went went wrong so that's the place that you can go and check so it's pointing you to a section of your code in that case it's pointing you to a section in a file. Yeah. Okay. If you create a new Django project, right? I think that's also something that, that shows something about how intimidating this can be at the beginning, right? If you if you use this, Django has a has a command called start project that you can run that builds a, a skeleton project for you automatically. Right. And if you if you so if you run this 
a command you get like you get a folder with a bunch of folders in it with a bunch of files in it and there's code in some of these files other files don't have code so it's you can you already feel some complexity when you just look at that right now you own all this stuff (laughs) and everything you know like everything is a piece that needs to interact with some other piece in order for this whole thing to function (laughs) so there you go (laughs) let's get started right so that can seem seem kind of daunting yeah okay (laughs) yeah exactly if you just keep that in mind uh it's that it's obviously very easy to break something in there right like you, you do a little piece wrong and it doesn't work in the way that it's supposed to. Yeah, it's but it's not a big deal. It's not a problem. And the computer is on your side trying to help you to resolve it if something went wrong. And the, the error message is just a way of communicating that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello, friend. In those cases, are you also diving into the documentation? Is that useful? The Django docs are often you know, hailed as, some, as like a very uh, resourceful and good documentation. For a framework, I personally find them not very easy to read. Okay, when I go there, I, it's it also feels like a, a lot of lines. <laughs> I think it, uh, there's a lot of information in there, but if you're at the beginning of working with Django, I think uh, it can feel overwhelming as well. Especially if you're kind of new to programming and you're not too used to to reading documentation, it's not the most fun way to get into something, in my opinion. Yeah, that's like a common answer on Stack Overflow. You know, the kind of rude answer of just read the <laughs> read the docs. docs or whatever <laughs> and if you're not an engineer and you're a beginner it's hard to even parse what's happening there do you have techniques that help you with that uh, so first of all i totally agree yeah it's like if you're already in this complex framework and then you go to look something up and then even like the s- solution or the instructions seem complex and con- daunting it can be quite like demotivating i think yeah i guess you filter through stuff you just so I guess the tip would be don't try to understand everything that's going on on that page or in that specific section of the docs that you're looking at because there's a lot there. For example, if there's like a, a piece you want to figure out in more detail or you know that your error is related to some specific part and you go to the docs and just look at this specific part. Okay. Would you use find or something? Yeah, yeah. The, I would just command F it Okay. or control F. Look at that part. For getting started, it's probably better to just go through a couple of tutorials. There's great tutorials out there online and just work through a couple of those rather than reading through the docs. Yeah, Django itself also has a example project that you can go through and that introduces you to a lot of those features that you need for building something with it. So you do a mix of teaching. You do video courses on Real Python. Tell me about the other jobs doing sort of remote training. So my main gig i guess where i work most of the time is a company called coding nomads we do boot camps and online courses okay so it's also in the programming education field i guess the idea is kind of that started off with a couple they they founded it together and they were traveling and uh, he's he's a software engineer and they just kind of wanted to open up this possibility that you travel and work at the same time and kind of like earn your living on the go okay. to more people. And development is a good way of doing that because there's a bunch of remote jobs available and you can earn quite well if you're good at it. <laughs> it's a nice way to, to get to see a bit of the world and uh, still <laughs> have money. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, so they founded this company, Coding Nomads, that was initially just doing boot camps in different locations around the world. We had boot camps running in, in Bali and, and in Thailand and Barcelona and at their home somewhere in California in Truckee. The idea also being kind of that the idea of a language ex- exchange, right? So you go somewhere and you immerse yourself into this different culture in a way. And at the same time, you learn a language. In that case, it's not the language of the country, but it's a programming language. Right. It's a different form of immersion. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But you're just together with a bunch of other learners that whose sole reason to be there is to like learn programming, right? So it's pretty intensive and uh, I think pretty effective, yeah, as well. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I taught two of those boot camps with Coding Nomads and it was a lot of fun uh, and a lot of work, <laughs> but I've enjoyed it a lot. What are common areas you see that students go through, things that frustrate students? Uh, when you teach uh, in live teaching or online? You know, either. What are things that, that you see students get kind of stuck on? When I think of, you know, like the whole process of, of going through a boot camp where we start from uh, more or less zero yeah. and get try to get people to a point where they have an understanding of web development, which with all of the stuff that comes with it, right? Okay. 
I think that a big step that people sometimes struggle with is that you go from uh, learning programming, learning a language, and you get to a point that you kind of understand Python and you understand that you can do something with code. And then getting into this, uh, like the step to going into, for example, using a web framework like Django, which introduces like all these additional things that you have to deal with. Because just like learning Python or learning programming concepts related to a specific language feels somewhat contained. You know, it's a it's a new topic, but getting the basics right and like like getting the basic understanding about it is it ends at some point, <laughs> and you, you can do something, right? All right. So you've learned the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You've learned the syntax. the syntax, you've learned the basics, but now to have an actual conversation with someone to write a play in that language, if you will, to <laughs> use the metaphor a little further, that's the struggle, like to, in this case, to take it and you know, actually write a program or you know, use a framework. I like what you said. Um, I don't uh, entirely mend it like that because I think a part of it is the complexity of that comes with web development. Like, I think it's related to that too, that there's, so many additional parts that are not just Python because you can write a program. Okay. Suddenly there's a point where you're like, okay, now we're going to use this web framework to sort of build something with Python, but you also are going to need to know what this thing HTML and CSS are. Right. And then you need to introduce those things. Yeah. So they're, they're structured in a way that we have some, we have a month online and then um, six to eight weeks uh, on site and then another month afterwards for projects. Okay. So that's, that's how the structure is. And, we're trying to get people to understand programming, like the, the basics of programming already before they come to the on-site part, because then it's just much more effective. If if, if everyone is at that point and they kind of have an understanding, then this difficult transition, I think, of like taking people from programming into using tools that uh, include programming, essentially, right? Right. Because that's what a framework is. Yeah. Then this transition happens much more smoothly. So one of the things I noticed in your course on Real Python is this interaction of a lot of people leaving comments and questions as they're they're going through stuff. Uh -huh. What's your experience been like with trying to respond to comments? I generally, I, generally, it's nice for me to do that. I've worked as a forum mentor for Udacity also for a couple of years, I guess. So I'm pretty used to responding to questions also in a text-based kind of way. What was the term you used? I'm sorry. Uh, what did I say? A fo forum mentor? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So you're in charge of uh, the board? Like, so that was the position. I don't know if they still have it, but at Udacity, at some point, they had this position where they have they had this discourse forums up. Yeah. And then it was just a person you were responding to questions that students had up there. Okay. So you're running the forum. Yeah. You're kind of running the forum, but. Or uh, moderating it in a, in a sense. And... Moderating, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> moderating, trying to answer student questions. Yeah. And then obviously, like with coding nomads, I, I do a lot of feedback in there's like online courses as well with st students where you, we don't see them in person, but just on, on calls and over text. But yeah, back to your question. Sorry. I think the format of the comments is a little bit different than a forum because it's not really like it's, it's not so much of a thread. Okay. Even though it's kind of like a thread because it's a comment to a specific video, but then often they kind of end up somewhere else than where they're actually supposed to be. Yeah, Because <laughs> it's a, a chunk of an uh, entire course, this little subsection mm -hmm. that is considered a lesson, but it's leading from somewhere into somewhere. Yeah, and then <laughs> it doesn't necessarily end in the right place. So it, that can be a bit <laughs> challenging, I think. You can't really move it around. Or I, I enjoy trying to help people to figure out stuff, I guess. That's that's how I see it. Similar to forum answers, you, you want to get to a point that you give the person the tools they need to figure out the answer themselves. Yeah. I guess that's how I, how I think about mentoring. That's what I try to do in those comments as well. It's like, you don't really want to give the answer because then it's just an answer and the student didn't really learn much. But if you push them into the right direction and then they figure it out themselves, that's usually the best way to go. What are techniques you use for pushing them? I guess step one is trying to understand what is actually the issue, if, if it's possible. What their real question is? Yeah, what are they asking? Okay. Sometimes there's already, you need to ask some questions to even get to that point that you understand it yourself. Right. And then once you understand where the student is coming from, I think you can, I don't know how to best describe it, start them thinking into a certain direction, I guess, is what I'm trying to do with a comment. I know where you're supposed, like the direction you're supposed to go, maybe, or hopefully. <laughs> 
this is what I think is, might spark you thinking towards there. Okay, so kind of going back to the beginning of that process, are they asking the right question? Mm -hmm. They may see something in front of them and maybe they want to do the same thing that they would do to Google and just paste their error code to you, mm -hmm. but without any kind of context. Are there good ways to help them think about, okay, if you're going to ask a question, here are some tips for asking the right type of question, you know, asking for help in the, the right kind of way. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, maybe we should have something like that sitting around, you know, like uh, it's usually when setting up a forum. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the first things I write and put there. <laughs> So that it's then easy to link to, you know. In your experience on like Udacity and stuff like that, it's like, hey, before writing your question, here's what to think about. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's, or here's like a, I set this up for our forums, for, for the Coding Nomads forums too. There's like uh, introductions on how to ask a question and how do you format your code? Because people, it's just things you don't know about. And there's so many different platforms too, you know, like you just land somewhere, you try to do something, it doesn't work. And then it's nice to have a link that you can send to help people figure it out for the next time. So what kind of things go into that document? You just mentioned the code formatting and, and things like that. Code formatting, yeah. And then for asking a question, like good tips for asking a question, I guess, is that you try to be as complete as possible with what you want to say. Like what's the context of your question, right? Okay. So that kind of depending on what it is that can go as far as like, that you need to know specifics about the operating system could be, it's not necessarily always that important, I think, but just some, like, I don't see your computer. I don't know what you're doing. I, I need to understand what's going on on the other end. So in the case of Python, that gets pretty complex quickly with the idea of multiple versions uh -huh. Yeah, and different installations. And so, yeah, it's like, tell, tell me about your Python environment <laughs> before... <laughs> Do you ask this kind of questions when you when you do uh, like occasionally? I an example recently trying to help out because uh, I was going to do this Arduino stuff, and a person mm -hmm. was having a lot of difficulty. A couple other people were commenting back and forth, and I felt like it wasn't really going in a way that was helpful to the student. So finally, it came out that the person was using uh, Raspberry Pi, and it's like, okay, well that's. <laughs> Uh, that, that changes, changes things, things. <laughs> pretty dramatically <laughs> in the sense that you know, it's a lower powered machine. You know, it is a computer, but it also is running a, a very specific version of Linux. It may or may not have mm -hmm. an actual code editor on it. The way that you install packages is going to be different. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like it really changed things up. And I had a Raspberry Pi that I've never done Python development on. And so I decided to kind of walk through that. Now, that's not something that somebody's going to be able to do in a forum or comment section often, but I took it on myself because I was doing this course and I was like, okay, maybe I will get questions like this and this is something I may want to hit on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt that that's a big part of it. Let's narrow this down. Hey, what are you using? What machine are you even on? <laughs> you know, what version of Python is it that's on there? And in their case, yeah. uh, they were using Thonny, which comes with it, but then that actually has its own sort of environment. So just simply doing like a pip install may not put what they need into the tool that they're using, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It kind of gets uh, multi-layered to try to create recreate the problem. And that's not something you can necessarily always do in comments, but you can try if the question is written well. Yeah, so I guess like operating system, editor, Python version are three useful pieces of information to include into a comment. I guess we could say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can be fairly short. Yeah. We were talking about, okay, are they asking the right question also? And then giving the context for it. The most difficult ones to answer also are just like, if you get a question which sometimes appears, uh, which sometimes come up, which is like, oh, this is not working for me. Right. And then, <laughs> right. And then it's like a back and forth. In itself, that's not really a question. It's just it's just an outburst of <laughs> being maybe annoyed right. by something not working. Right. And then there's all this emotional <laughs> weight in contained in that too yeah. and you're like i feel your pain <laughs> and the frustration there uh, you know maybe <laughs> i was just thinking maybe that's maybe that's the right response to a question like that so one of the areas you know beyond going into you know these errors appearing in your code and and you having issues kind of going back and forth with just figuring out what the error is mm -hmm. do you find good techniques to get into debugging your code then 
what are what are techniques that you use for for debugging yeah so it's actually like the the step after you get the error you you got the error and you're not afraid of it okay what do you do next it's your friend it's just trying to help you it's waving there hey look this happened <laughs> yeah let's try to figure it out together and then what's the what's the tools like like it depends what's the complexity of the program you're working with i think you know the good old print statement can often be very helpful if you're working on a smaller program and in Django, I guess when you think about a web framework like that, I try to think of the the screen, the pages that you get, the uh, that actually get rendered. That's somewhat like your output. Yeah, you can more or less do something similar to a print statement by just including a variable and printing it out on the screen. That's something you can do. And then depending on which editor you're working with, there's like pretty good and pretty cumbersome <laughs> debuggers as well. I've been uh, like on the, in that course. I'm working with uh, with PyCharm. And Pygem has a pretty good debugger included where you can get the program to run and then figure out uh, what, what are the current variables that are defined and just inspect them more in more detail, things like that. In the case of this PyCharm tool, the debugger there, mm-hmm. uh, in order to show you what's going on... You run it in, like you have to run it in debug mode. Okay, so you're running your existing script or program in debug mode yes and then what happens and then you can set uh, like you can set breakpoints which just means you you mark up a certain piece of code okay you say like stop here debugger and then that's what the debugger does like once it hits that line of code it's it stops execution and essentially gives you a window into how does your program look at the moment what are the variables defined different ways of showing it like there's uh, different levels of complexity of debuggers as well but i think of it like this like you get insight into the current state of your program and then you can play around there and figure out what's going on cool in the course that you just released that's about the different editor tools yeah what are the types of editors you were showing so what i tried to do there uh kind of you know there's so many editors out there and (laughs) right people have like their special favorite editor it's religious in some cases and it's yeah it's sometimes <laughs> sometimes very stressful especially if you're getting started and it, like you're supposed to pick a tool and then you even do some research and then <laughs> which is the right one and you can get very strong op- opinions one way or another right, right. <laughs> what i was trying to do is just look at those editors in a more type kind of manner so like what type of editors exist categorically categories yes okay and then t- pick one example for for each of the categories okay Obviously, the categories are not like that as clear cut, and I'm sure there's more than the ones that I presented. But I just thought these are kind of like categories that make sense to me, and the, they have different use cases. And then, depending on what your use case is, you can choose maybe one of those editors w- w- when it best fits the job. So, where did you start with that? What type of categories are there? So, the ones that I made up <laughs> for this, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I thought of like an editor. So I was looking at uh, at Vim as the first one. Okay, as just an editor that's always there for you. Doesn't matter where you're working. If you're on, as long as you're on a Unix system, which means if you're working with Linux, macOS, or usually if you're on a server, you're working on a Linux system. Okay, Vim is going to be there, so that it just comes with the operating system. And so the advantage there is that doing some virtual machine work with like AWS mm-hmm. to keep them lightweight, they will have like typically of a, a small distribution of, of Linux. But even in that case, they would have this editor of Vim already there. Right, yeah. If you spin up a, ser- a server somewhere in one of these uh, cloud platforms, it's not going to come with your favorite editor, right. unless your favorite editor is Vim. <laughs> PyCharm's not going to be there. Exactly. And, or VS Code or something. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's the that's the real advantage in the way that I'm using Vim, at least. Like uh, I know there's power users that know all the shortcuts and can <laughs> fly around on the keyboard just doing things on Vim that are close to magic. But uh, I'm not like that. For me, it's just a, a simple tool that I know it's going to be there and I know the basics of it and can work with that, essentially. And I think it's useful for that. Nice. And then what's the next level or next categorical thing? Then I was looking at Tony, actually, uh, as a beginner-friendly editor. Uh, have you worked with it a bit? I have dabbled very briefly it is the one thing that was on the raspberry pi <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> and so i was like kind of uh dabbling with it a little bit there there's some good resources on real python for it mm-hmm. i started in sublime which i kind of came from doing some html and css stuff 
And yeah. that was the one that kept coming out to me was Sublime. And then actually that's how I kind of got introduced to a lot of Dan stuff because he had a course on it, customizing it to be able to be work with, better with Python. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I actually also started with Sublime. It was my, the first editor I, I did more work with. And I still enjoy working with it. And uh, I haven't, like, in the course, I'm not talking about Sublime specifically, but instead about VS Code. And I think, like, VS Code, Sublime, Text, and Atom are somewhat, like, they're, for me, one one category of, like, text editors that are more lightweight and have some IDE features, but they're not, like, full-blown IDEs. Right. What does IDE stand for? IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. What else does it integrate, then, to make it be a different level? Yeah, so if you think of... PyCharm for uh, if you've already worked with it, uh, like it, it has definitely it's got a terminal, it's got a de- debugger, it's got database features. Uh, oh, okay. It's got the text editor, tons and tons of features. But like the big IDEs really have a lot of like I know a small percentage of what's possible to do with with these tools, right? Yeah, I dabbled with Xcode. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, that's another example. It. it tries to be an end-all, be-all. I'll double-click on a file sometimes and it'll just be like, I'm going to open that in Xcode. I'm like, well, okay, wait, hold on. <laughs> I don't <laughs> I just want to look at it. <laughs> I just want to see the text. <laughs> then you have startup time of like 30 seconds. or <laughs> Just to get an idea of what's, what, you know, it's a markdown file or something that's just yeah. text inside of it. So that's kind of like the three then? Oh, wait, how many did we have? Oh, we did Vim, Donnie as a beginner, then yeah, the, the Sublime Atom VS Code. Then we had the IDEs, so big IDEs like like PyCharm, and I'm talking about PyCharm in the course. Okay. Uh, and then I also looked at Jupyter Notebooks. Oh, okay. That's a whole other thing, uh, sort of an online tool. Because that's kind of a whole other thing, yeah. <laughs> that's how I also think about it. <laughs> okay. You said you did a course on that too. Right. So yeah. we'll have to link to that. I really enjoy working with uh, Jupyter Notebooks as well. It's uh, it's very explorative, and it's can be like telling a story or telling a story to yourself while you're coding. I noticed some... You know, potential pitfalls that people fall in. And then I watched kind of a, a cool video of where this guy was like not a huge fan. And I could sort of see the reasons in the, the idea mm-hmm. you can approach the idea of these cells in different orders. You may not know what the state things are in. Right. And so that could be yeah. a little bit of a pitfall. <laughs> and I thought that was a really kind of important thing for people to remember. It's like, well, you can just rerun this thing here and now your values are totally changed. And you won't necessarily know what the state of things are unless you're you know, aware of the ability for that to happen <laughs> yeah there's a bit of a like this tricky thing of that you have these code blocks and it feels like they're separate things but in the end like behind all of these code blocks there's just one big pile <laughs> yeah of where everything goes and uh, gets changed <laughs> yeah that's important so one of the things that i'm trying to get into on the podcast is have a, a weekly recurring question mm-hmm. What are you currently excited about in the world of Python? And it could be an event that's happening. Uh, it could be packages or pieces of code that you're interested in. It could be an editor or hardware. What are you excited about right now? So I'm going to give a general shout out to Python as a language. I think something I'm just excited about is the versatility that just keeps surprising me. How it is this nice combination of being uh, relatively easy to learn, but then you can use it in so many different types of things. Because one thing I'm excited about in, in programming is it's not necessarily doing, like not everyone needs to be a programmer, right? But I think everyone benefits from knowing a little bit about programming in whatever field they're in. It's just really helps you do stuff more effectively and I like supercharge the, the things that you can do, right? And I think Python is just a, it's, it's a great language for that. What are some of the uses you, you have for it? Like ranges from building websites, building web pages we, we talked about, and then also just like automating little things on, for myself. I, I wrote a small script that just brings me up some writing prompts every day so that I remember to take some moments to reflect on stuff, for example. And it's just, oh, cool. You know, like little things you can do that you can build by yourself and then can automate some of the work that you otherwise have to do manually. I'm working on creating something like that for the courses that I do. Yeah. Basically, go look at this folder and how many how many minutes of video I have in there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> um, and that is like a real pain in the butt to like do the math of minutes to you know hours and just like trying to do all that in your head. Yeah, when you when you see things like that, it's just that's what computers are there for, right? <laughs> right. 
Yeah, something popped into my head too, like that's music and programming related. Uh, I recently got myself this a device called Leap Motion. I don't know if you heard about it. Oh, huh, what is that? It's a hand motion sensor. So it's like it's a very small box, USB connected. Okay. That measures like that. It's. I, I think they use it a lot in VR devices, and maybe they have it included in some of the newer headsets. This is just like a little box that you put down, and then your computer like can recognize all sorts of your intricate movements of your hands, essentially position and whether you have them closed or open, or you're moving them up or down or forward, etc. So it's not a glove per se. It's a device that. No, no. It's your hands are free. Okay. Yeah, it just looks at your hands. It's like a camera that figures out your hands. I don't know how exactly, but it's pretty accurate. Okay. And someone made a software for it called Gecko that allows you to control like synthesizers with it. Nice. <laughs> you can assign patterns to different hand movements and then interact essentially with your software or hardware synthesizer through moving your hands. <laughs> oh, super cool. I definitely you gotta we'll have the links to the that in the show notes i'll have to get that from you mm-hmm. yeah that's pretty fun i've I've been tr- trying to play around with that a bit but got stopped because i updated my operating system mac os to to the newest one and all of the audio software broke so <laughs> oh, no. i gotta figure that out was that catalina or whatever it is yeah yeah so if you're trying to do something with that with audio don't update to catalina <laughs> yeah it does some weird stuff to Here's a big warning to other Python people out there. It does some really strange stuff to your Python installation too. Will break the ability to compile uh, stuff. So, like a, a common thing people ask me about when they watch my videos is this REPL replacement I use called B Python, mm-hmm. and it has to basically do a real simple compilation. And there's some commands that you can do to 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 fix it. Um, and I'll put a link in the, in the show notes. But yeah, that's one of the issues with uh, the latest version of uh, the Mac OS is it changes some of the behaviors. I, I had heard that they were going to not include Python with it at all, but that isn't true. They actually are still including it. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe the next version or future versions, they're, they're trying to decouple it because they, they were really tied to Python 2. And is it still Python, Python 2 that's included? With the new, I don't know. I haven't run Catalina because I, I know it's going to break my audio stuff. Right. <laughs> I guess I could check it out. <laughs> you should find out. Yeah, if you type Python, yeah. does it do two or does it do three? Well, I got it mapped differently with uh, you know pip pip and py and already from before. So my Python is like some shim, <laughs> as pip and calls it. Okay, so it's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, it's it's working, but that that means I don't know exactly what's the system Python version. And I guess the other question I had is, is something new I'm trying. Mm-hmm. What kind of music do you listen to when you're coding? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of a listen and repeat kind of person, if that's a thing. So I, I get like a song stuck in my head. Okay. And it just loops in my head anyways. So sometimes I just put it on and then loop it <laughs> in uh, in audio. You could offload some of the processing to uh, it doing that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's something I do sometimes, and then I just listen to the same song for an hour or something. <laughs> what kind of music is that? Uh, that that really depends. Like whatever pops in my head, I don't know. It's quite varied, I guess. But I, I also like to listen to just some ambient sounds. Like there's this nice page called Noisely that I sometimes use, where you can switch on different types of like fire crackling or water trickling, etc. And that's pretty <laughs> nice as well. <laughs> that's cool. But in terms of actual music, I guess. Um, I have like some, sometimes I listen to like classical music playlists or, or this chill hop okay. stuff. Uh, there's this, this girl that sits and studies forever. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> there's this uh-uh. lo-fi hip <laughs> and it's just a radio that keeps running oh, Okay, of a girl sitting and studying and she moves her pen a little bit. So it's like a YouTube thing? It, yeah, yeah, that's on YouTube. Yeah. Both of those. And okay. I, I also just switch on some classical playlists on YouTube sometimes. Cool. So this is the point where we said our goodbyes originally. But as I was mentioning in the intro, Martin wanted to come back to discuss the stay-at-home mentorship program he's working on with Coding Nomads and how you can become a part of it. And we also get the chance to answer our first listener-submitted audio question. So here's the rest of the conversation. Thanks for the idea of like re-recording this or, or adding this on. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, well, I think it's good timing. A lot of people are in sort of lockdown kind of situation working from home, not working from an office, and maybe they have extra time or they really want to learn more about coding. So tell me about what's going on. So yeah, with the lockdowns happening, 
and me listening to the news, like I guess everyone does, I've just had this feeling that I wanted to try to do something from my end to help a little. And I know it's not much and I don't have the feeling that <laughs> there's like that it's a big deal or anything, but I, I, I just tried to spin up some, some kind of mentorship program for, for people to get the chance to at least use the time that they're in lockdown a little bit to maybe start a few steps on a, on a path of getting into a position where they have more chance to work remotely or to work in the tech sector. Yeah. Yeah. I think we both like for me personally in a work situation, nothing much has changed uh, with being in lockdown because I've been lucky enough to have been working remotely already before. So it's, <laughs> there's not much change for me, but there's a, a huge change for like millions of people out there. And some are in really bad situations of like not being able to go to work and then uh, not being able to make the income that they need to pay their debts and just keep the machine running, so to say. Right. Yeah. And I've just thought, I mean, I know from personal experience that in the tech sector, you have some opportunities that make it easier to, to get into remote work than in, let's say, if you're working in a restaurant, right? Right. And that's really, that's what I can offer. That's that's what I'm working in. I'm working in programming education and in, in mentorship. So um, I thought, Let's try to connect some people that are ready to give some of their time as, as volunteers to help some people that are in a completely different um, environment and in a completely different situation. Just be that person that you can connect to and that is already somewhere down the road and has like a bit of an understanding of what's going on and help them um, take these first steps and maybe move into a different direction. So with this program, you're looking at, at kind of both sides, right? You're looking to have people who would like to be a mentor on, you know, it's kind of a smaller scale, not as necessarily a job, but just would like to be a mentor and have a way to share their knowledge mm -hmm. and a way to connect to the world, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, I think like a lot of us maybe have this feeling that we want to do something and want to do something that's in some way helpful for people that are in a like less fortunate situation, I guess. We, we have some mentors that we're working with professionally with, with our students in, at Coding Nomads, but obviously the, the, like this number is limited. An effort like that, it's just, based on volunteership and I don't know if that's the word volunteership, but <laughs> sure, you know what I mean, right? You want to help and someone who needs help. And that's really like what I want to do with this project is just make it easier to make that connection and provide people with the experience and the resources that we have, have built up and that, that I have built up anyways, because that's what we do <laughs> for a job, so to say. Cool. Yeah. How do people find out more about it or how do they apply if they're interested? Yeah, so I set up a form on a quick form on GitHub that's at, we're, we're going to put it in the links, right? Yep, I'll have it there. Uh, but it's Coding Nomads GitHub IO and then Stay at Home Dash Mentorship. That's what we called it because that's what it's about, right? Stay at Home. Yeah, no, it's good. It's a good name. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there's, there's more information on there. The idea is really to, to try to bring it to people like on the student side to bring it to people who are in a like really bad financial situation due to the lockdowns who've, who've lost their jobs lost significant amounts of work and are just maybe understanding that the system in a couple of places isn't really set up to support them in a situation like that i don't know so that's that's been interesting if you want to talk about it for a second it's it's been interesting for me to see that also and my perspective is obviously i just i'm a european and my girlfriend's from the US, so this is the two areas that I kind of have the most insight to. And I know there's like the situation is probably very different in, in other places of the world, but I, I can just talk about this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what I've seen there, like it's it's interesting to see that, let's say in Austria, my, my home country, it feels that there is some kind of a, a social network provided by, by the government that, that keeps the, the situation from escalating to a certain degree. That I have the feeling in the States as, as one of the, like, or the wealthiest country, I guess, you would kind of expect that there's a, a better um, security net. But it seems that through the economic setup, I don't know, just with, with people not having sick leave and with people easily getting fired if they can't show up for work and health insurance being so, I don't know, sparsely spread out or tied to, to having a job in the first place. It's very easy that, that you just can't, you can't self isolate because if you do, you lose all possibilities of, of having health insurance and, and getting money to pay your debts. So that's just been interesting to see. I think that, that it's not really set up for, I don't know, buffering some, 
a situation, a crisis situation like that very well. All right. Yeah, it's not, there's not much of a, a net, uh, as you said. Yeah. It's nice to see people like yourself trying to come up with ways to, to help people out. And some of these people may be wanting to shift careers or were interested in programming and Python's such a great language to start with, mm -hmm. as we've already discussed throughout the rest of the episode earlier. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're hoping using some of these tools, I mean, that's um, Real Python recently had not only all the articles that are on the site, but some free courses, which was kind of a neat deal. Totally. I think there's a lot, like, I mean, that's a nice thing to see also in such a situation. There's a lot of people who are trying to do something. They want to help because we feel for, like, other people in the world and we want to try to do something useful, right? Right. Yeah. And I guess that's just, it depends on what what industry you're in, what you can do. And as long as you don't have the feeling that you're saving the world with what you're doing, but <laughs> have some kind of humility and understanding that it's probably not a lot in, in terms of the grand scale of things, but that doesn't mean it's useless. But yeah, but you're making a difference. Yeah, you're doing a little bit and maybe it helps a couple of people. And it's been nice, like since we launched this, uh, the program, like I've started it off as simple form and then <laughs> went on to build a Django app for it and a Django, a Django REST framework API to like better handle the, the data. Cool. Since we launched it, which was about a week ago, I guess, we already got uh, 40 mentors that signed up. And we've got like, I think 75 uh, slots for students that we can just connect these people with and give them a chance to like get started on, on a path into a direction of doing something, some technical work or some design. Yeah, so um, it's also not necessarily limited to programming or Python. It's just the idea is really just to get professionals or people who, who have some knowledge together with people who, who want to start on that path. And great. I think from my experience, like having someone that you can speak to and being part of a community really makes a big difference in, in the motivation and just sticking with something and, and having the feeling that you can do it, you know, not just being overwhelmed with it. Cool. That's great. I really appreciate what you're doing there. That's awesome. And we have links for all that information for anybody who's interested in being a mentor or would like to get a little more mentorship. And again, like you said, it's not specifically just Python based, but generally technological kind of stuff. So all that will be on the show notes. Uh, just as a quick, like, so if you're interested in this at all, like the idea is just if you have some skills that you, that you can provide, uh, you're ready to spend just an hour per week per student, essentially is what, what we're thinking. Really just to be this person that, uh, that they can check in with and that they can learn from a little bit of, of what's going on and ask some questions when they're stuck. That's really like what, what we, we'd ask you to provide for this. And we're going to offer, like, so I have this mentorship docs that have a lot of information about how you can mentor a person in a good way if you're interested in reading up and stuff. And we will provide you this. We provide uh, access to content for, for Java and Python courses for, for a month for free for students and also for the mentors, obviously. And also we have this community forum that everyone is free to join and that you can use to connect with your students and, and help them connect with the community because I think that that's a great thing. Like if you're, if you feel, if you get someone to a point that they feel they're part of a community where they can ask questions and they're welcome and they can keep learning. I think that that's a great way to get someone started and uh, on, on a path of success to actually moving forward with that. But yeah. Make this connection. Maybe that would be great. And I'm, I'm there to contact if, if there's, if people have questions or if they want to reach out and talk about mentorship, I'm very happy to do that anytime. Are the meetings like using like a video chat kind of thing? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's just a video chat. So there's information, some possible ways that you can do this in this mentorship docs. I have a lot of tools listed out that are useful for that. But essentially, you're free to use whatever. I'm, I'm not a designer myself, but we have design on there also because it's a it, it's a useful skill to have. Yeah, okay. And if, if someone's a professional designer, they probably know what's a good way to, to learn, like what's a good online resource. And they can just use that resource and whatever works best, right? And uh, I'm happy to help someone figure that out through the documentation and also just in communication with them. All right, that's great. So I mentioned in episode two, when I was talking with John Fincher, that I was excited about setting up this way for listeners of the podcast to submit questions as audio, and then we could play them on there. Well, I have my first question. And the question is from Sean Tibor of the Teaching Python podcast, uh, which is a great podcast if you're interested in learning about not only more about Python, but also about being a teacher and teaching your students about Python, which we're doing a lot of that kind of in this episode. Mm -hmm. So he had a question for us and I'll play it here. Hey, Christopher, this is Sean and Kelly from the Teaching Python podcast. First, we want to say congratulations for launching your podcast. We're really excited that there's another Python podcast out here. 
it's such a fast growing language, there's definitely room for more voices in the Python sphere. And we're just really excited that you're joining us. My question is, and I guess it's for you, Christopher, or for any of the guests that are on your show this week. If you had to start learning Python again from scratch, if you didn't know anything about the language, where would you start or what would you do differently than what you did when you actually learned it for the first time? We're curious because a lot of our students are trying to figure the same question out for themselves about what to learn and where to go and how far to go. So for us, it's a really fascinating topic to learn about those first few steps in how to learn Python. Thanks very much. Congratulations again. And we can't wait to hear more. All right. So that's a nice question from them. So I'll post it to you, you first, Martin. Do you have a suggestion for Sean and Kelly? Uh, yeah. I, it's related a bit to what I was talking about through this whole episode, I think. But what I think I would do differently is I would really look for connections in a like a community of people that are learning or teaching, but just a community of people that are doing Python on a regular basis. And maybe even more specifically, like if there's maybe I'm interested in music production with Python, like I, I would just try to to find a community that does that specific thing with the programming language uh, and then just get involved there. Because for me, at least as a person, and I know people learn in different ways, but for me, it's it's very engaging to be in contact with people and it helps me to stay engaged and keep having fun while I learn something. Just being able to like talk it over with someone. I think that's what I would do instead of just trying to learn by myself online. Uh, and there's different ways of doing that. There's, you know, there's boot camps, there's uh, forums, there's there's lots of different ways, but just this not isolate much <laughs> and to try to get it all by myself, just try to find people and, and interact with them about it. Yeah. I think that would be my main difference. Yes, I was thinking about that. Like the thing, the forum that you just were talking about, but also Dan has a Pythonisa cafe. Mm -hmm which is a neat community site, which is friendly in there. Obviously, RealPython itself has a huge footprint. And if you join, then there's also the whole forums and Slack channels and areas to, to talk to people. But there's lots of solutions out there in these sort of microcosms of the internet. It takes a little bit to learn them. But in general, when I've tried to reach out, you know, people have been, usually have been pretty friendly about that. It makes me think about uh, you know, the idea of sharing. You know, as a musician, it's so hard to take a piece of music that you've created and share it with say your family or even other people that are like at your school or whatever. They may not be interested at all, especially my family. They could care less about anything I do musically, you know, it's, Oh, that's nice, you know, and so forth. So it's so much better to have a way to take a piece of art or in this case, you know, something you've poured your heart and soul into of programming to have somebody else who's in a similar world or in even a similar level and share it with them and to have a conversation about it, it it's so much more useful. I, I find that great. I, I've had to start to try to do that with podcasts, <laughs> you know, and, and the idea of like, okay, now that I'm sharing this new idea with with other you know people that are out there, I have a friend who I knew back from Arizona who is a guru about podcasting. And so I wanted to reach out to him to ask him questions and the community can be a really big thing. So yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. If I was going to answer the question, I feel like I'm still in the throes of, of learning. And so I have always been a person who buries myself in a subject. So I'm going to learn Python. Great. So I go and I find a ton of books. I started doing like the humble bundle thing where they'll offer a whole set of books. And, you know, so I start collecting lots of different things and, and kind of Having all those resources around me is always kind of useful. I have always been a person who I went out and found all the different Python podcasts and tried to listen up and, and so forth. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, a form of immersion. I think something that was a little missing is what you were talking about of having a little bit more of a community, somebody to talk to back and forth as I'm developing it and creating things. But one of the things that I did initially was I did tons and tons of tutorials but they were all by the end of them, the tutorial from the book or the tutorial from the, mm -hmm. you know, the website or whatever. And I could share them with a handful of people, but it wasn't really my own work. And so it wasn't until I started to uh, shift that thinking, thinking about problems that I have in my own life and struggles that I have in my own life that we were speaking about earlier in the episode and scratching that own itch and saying, Hey, I, I need a tool to do this, or I'm interested in the subject and I want to learn data visualizations. And so I want to create this. And so having projects and they can be small, 
this kind of goes back to episode two and, and having constraints on your project and building up from there and saying, okay, I, it just needs to be able to do this initially. That's fine. It doesn't have to be perfect. I have a problem with perfectionism and I don't start because of that. And so it's hard to break that, but you have to realize that you do have to start and, and, and yeah, yeah, it suck. That's okay. It's totally fine. And what you need to do is just get past that hurdle and, and keep making and keep creating and, and so forth. And so I think I would have spent way more time shifting and building more projects and trying to take what I learned a little bit in that tutorial and and make it my own and maybe you know, making a website for a friend or, or a small organization mm-hmm. with something like Django, like what you just did. I'm sure you learned a ton just doing that mm-hmm. and practicing those skills again and then being able to say, yeah, oh, I built that. It's such a cool thing to be able to do. I thought of another resource is uh, something called Project Euler. Basically, the idea of it is there are these problems, usually mathematical or it could be, you know, dates or whatever. And the project presents, you know, solve this. And it doesn't care what language it's in, but usually there'll be answers in a variety of different languages, you know, everything from mm-hmm. C to Java to JavaScript or Python. And the idea is to take it and try to solve it on your own. And it's really great to be able to then look at the solution that you've came up with, or even if you have it partway done, to then come back and then say, okay, well, how did they solve this? And it's a really good way to kind of learn, you know, creating something and, and really programming is problem solving. So finding the problems to solve. Mm-hmm. And reading someone else's code also, that you get a chance to do that. Oh, yeah. Which helps. <laughs> yeah, if you're interested in a particular topic, like, you know, maybe it's games and so forth, going up on GitHub and seeing some of the open source stuff that's out there. I wanted to create a contact management system, again, kind of scratching my own itch. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, what exists? What are what are tools that are out there and how do they try to solve it? And you can learn a lot just by just staring at other people's code. You're right. Yeah, that, I like what you said also. But uh, I mean, uh, I honestly think that th- this immersion that you talked about sound, sounds like a pretty good way to, of, of getting into something. You know, like you just, because it sounds like you have, the, you have the motivation there. And I think like motivation is like such a huge factor. Right. And whatever is the way that you get your motivation like just focus on on doing more of that. I think if it comes through like building a little solution for yourself that that you can then interact with daily and maybe improve on, or if it's like talking to people in in a certain community, or I don't know, maybe if it's even like you know finishing a couple of badges in in a, in an online course that you're going to, whatever really your motivation is. I think it's it's such like because learning something new essentially it's it's always about putting in the time and putting in the focus. You you just have to do this these two things. If you don't put in the time and the focus, then you, you don't really get anywhere. It's it takes time and focus. Yeah, and I have a feeling like if you think of it like a formula, there's this multiplication with motivation, right? Kind of like maybe time plus <laughs> focus times mo- motivation or something like that. Yeah, sure. So the motivation factor is a huge thing, and as long as you can keep that one high, I think you're on a good path, and you're gonna you're gonna keep working on it, and that's and that's what makes you learn it eventually. Yeah, I thought about another thing that I used when I was initially learning. I I would find these apps for my phone that were really snippet-based Python things. And and like you said, kind of I would be happy to finish these little badges of like, okay, I learned loops and I learned this and you know, and checking those things off. And so I'll include links to a lot of the the resources. Um this episode's gonna be so long in links, which is gonna be awesome. <laughs> so please check that stuff out. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically, you know, all that stuff at realpython.com slash podcast. You can see all the links. Or actually, you know, I, one thing that's come up is if you want to be able to jump around in the episode, we started publishing the episode with time code. So you can actually go in and you can, if you have a player, I use Overcast, but there's like a, all these different players now have the ability to, you know, you can tap on the time code and it'll jump to that subject in that area. Um, I have chapter markers and some people don't have a tool to listen to. So we have been publishing it on YouTube, also on our YouTube channel for real Python. And that has the time code too in the notes. So you can actually jump around if you want to repeat something or you want to go back and listen to something. Great. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Which is kind of takes a little more time, but I think it's worth it. Well, I really want to thank you for coming on or actually coming back on. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. And I'm excited to learn more about how your uh, mentoring project stuff goes. Um, so I'll have to keep in touch on that. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's going to help a couple of individuals uh, in this situation and just maybe make make a bit of a tighter net in the 
programming and community and maybe also connecting to a bunch of other people that are not yet in there. So, Yeah, great. And remember, if you have questions, anybody out in the audience and you want to send them in, we'll play them on the podcast. And we're talking about eventually doing some panel shows and answering those types of questions, also the wider group. So thanks again. Thanks to you as well. And have a nice day still. All right. Bye. I want to thank Martin Royce for being my guest this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey. I look forward to talking to you soon.